Okay, I think we're going to get started. Again, welcome to High Tech 2014. Um, at this time, it's my privilege to welcome one of our students from Wilbur Wright College. Um, Alex Montavo is a sophomore at Wilbur Wright College, and he will be singing the national anthem, so if we could please rise. Taxi to the museum. 
campus, so you can actually go down to the planetarium, uh, the aquarium, and the field museum. Um, you can also, from here, if you just walk south, um, go to Millennium Park, and um, lots of things to see in Millennium Park, and right on the other side of Millennium Park is the um, Art Institute. And then um, finally, you know, we'd like to see you spend some money on the Magnificent Mile. So on the Magnificent Mile, of course, if you just go um, a little west to Michigan Avenue, you can go north, and you're in walking distance of the Magnificent Mile, which has tons of, of shopping, and uh, you might want to visit the water tower place in, in particular, okay? Um, so I'd like to welcome you to, to Chicago. We're really happy to have you. I hope you have a, um, a good time here in Chicago. Take advantage of the location. We're at a wonderful location for, for a conference. Um, and at this uh, time, I'd like to um, introduce one of our locals um, from City Colleges, um, Mr. Uh, Mike Davis, and he will tell you a little bit about Chicago. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for being here. Like John said, we are overjoyed for you to be in Chicago for this conference. You are here at just the right time of year. You are here to see the Chicago Cubs begin their inevitable march towards World Series victory in 2014. <laughs> and I understand at least one of you is going to go see them play uh, tomorrow night, so I'm really excited for that. So go Cubs. Um, I work for the City College of Chicago. <laughs> I live right by that minor league team. They're, they're adorable. <laughs> So one of, the, one of the great things about Chicago is that it's a very large and also a deeply personal town. You, you probably just caught on that in this little conversation here. And there's this great sort of Chicago phrase, I got a guy, okay? So if you're looking for tickets, hey, come talk to me, I got a guy. So that sort of thing kind of permeates what the Chicago culture is. Now I work for the City Colleges of Chicago. We have 120,000 students throughout our seven independently accredited colleges throughout the district. Um, we have a program called College to Careers, which I think really you know, embodies a lot of the values that are here in high tech, where we really make intimate connections between what's going on in two-year colleges, transfer to four-year colleges, and ultimately college and career readiness. That's where we play on the professional side of things. On the personal side of things, and I'm going to tell you this short story before um, I introduce Mike Wasecki. On the personal side of things, I actually got to experience this firsthand. You see, I taught chemistry for city colleges for on the order of 10 years. And in doing so, I just knew I was producing a lot of nurses for the city. So in 2010, when we were, my wife and I were preparing to have our first son over at uh, Rush Hospital, we had a plan. No drugs, no C-section. Anyone that's ever gone into childbirth knows that that plan is solid. <laughs> so we get in there, and uh, those plans are almost immediately scuttled. There was an epidural, which I think was a good decision. <laughs> And then um, after, I think the first 23-ish hours or so, um, there were signs of what's called meconium aspiration, which if you're familiar is when like the baby stools inside the womb and kind of inhales, so that, that there's a big breath of poop right there. And it's not, uh, you know, it's really not something you want to hear, like, oh, there's meconium aspiration, be ready for that. What is ready for that? I don't know what that is. So uh, now there's going to be an emergency C-section because pushing is not productive. So we get wheeled into the operating room. I'm all gammed up. My, my wife is doped up to the nines. And uh, you know, we're ready to go. And when I was prepared by television, this, this is not the way to prepare for this kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, a, a baby was extracted, but there was no cry. There was no joyous, it's a boy. There was immediately rushing the baby to a warming table. There was a team of nurses surrounding the baby. When I first got to see him, he was immediately intubated. I was not prepared for this. So I went back and sat down by my wife's head. And I just lost it. She was no help. <laughs> she, she looked over and smiled, and, and she did everything she was supposed to do with that smile. But um, I just, I was just crying, and the doctor handed me a couple of pieces of gauze, which I'm sure I paid for. And we, uh, so I, I blotted my eyes and said, "Hey, you know, a couple of nurses told me you were the chemistry teacher in college." You should be proud. They're really good nurses. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, that's something. <laughs> and after a couple of after a couple of hours, when he was uh, taken into the NICU, and I could see that he had six pounds, eleven ounces, he was a strapping young man in the NICU. And my students, who I found, were working on babies who were far smaller than him. 
working with parents who probably haven't slept in days. <clears throat> I was really, really proud of those students. They helped me when I needed it the most. I was helping them learn chemistry, which, you know, at the time made a lot of sense to me, but now, and even embodied here through high tech, we have the opportunity. What we're doing is we're putting our students in a position that are eventually going to help us. So again, what we did is we played in this area professionally. I experienced it personally. And, and my wife, who's here today, can you stand up for a quick second? Uh, her and I have another date night coming up on Thursday of next week when we're going to have our second child. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we went, through the, we went through this together, but it was one of these experiences where we could see the education that we gave actually, you know, you talk about college and career readiness, I'm talking about the skills that, you know, probably saved a life. And we think about that in all the different areas in which we play. So this is a wonderful conference for us to actually get together and confer on these things. Welcome to our city. Everything that John pointed out to you is a wonderful thing to do. I also assume that you're all here to gain at least five pounds. Chicago is known for that. So uh, walk it all off. There's great walking tours throughout the city. I'd like to introduce um, Mike Lasecki. He's going to come up here. He's one of the people who's worked very hard on putting this wonderful conference together. Him, the Shield, and John Sands. Give them all a big hand for everything they've done. Technology. He said it was the Atari, was it the 2600? 
the Atari 2600. So, uh, for those of you who understand what that means, my big uh, <laughs> He figured that he, he, uh, his path to technology started with that Atari game console. He figured out he better know how to use this uh, going forward, and that's how it happened. So, join me in welcoming uh, Chad to our uh, podium. And so we're getting closer and closer to that. 
And so an example of this is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a robot we have in our lab. So this is, uh, this is the main robot. Uh, this is my collaborator, David Liu, uh, who's in, who actually is in St. Louis. He works with us from St. Louis. My lab is in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, David worked with us on projects that involve uh, the NASA Robonaut 2. And so the NASA Robonaut 2 is a robot that works on the, web, on the, on the International Space Station. Um, and, but we work on web interfaces so people around the world should be able to control this and run experiments for, for the system. For in terms of doing citizen science, I will. I can that that whole talk about the robot too is a completely separate talk. Um, but I really want to talk about how David Liu can engage people in our lab. And so I just want to show a quick video of David Liu uh, chasing my kids around the lab. Um, so David Liu, he, you know, he still can't reach through the screen. But he can do things to affect. He can actually, through this robot, be able to touch my kids, chase them around, do things that we couldn't do with Skype. Um, my daughter thought he could trick him in that case, but 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 not. Um, and so the beam is really so so it really gets to how we can reach out and touch one another. And so if you have two people that are that are apart geographically in the world, we can think of all sorts of ways that we can that we've developed all sorts of ways to make this happen. And so. The, the best way that we, will, that we will never really replace is having two people, having people come together physically. That's something you can't, you, you know, that's something that's really fundamental to us as, as human beings. And so you can fly somewhere, you can travel, you can take a, you can take, uh, you know, take a boat, take a car, really being there in person, there's no, there's no replacement for that. But we've developed over, over our history some ways of trying to, trying to get some sense of it. And so, if you think about these over time, what we've developed are things like mail, text mail, um, uh, phone, long distance to be able to communicate over long ranges. And that really is the automation of messaging, automation of messaging around the world. And we call that telecommunications. Um, and we were able to do that up, to, to, up through, the, through the 1970s, 80s. It was expensive, it was very low bandwidth, there was only so much you could communicate. But, with the ad, but, with, with, but when your phone started to become an automator of information, which we really call a computer, that's when it started to take off and you can do it cheaply, you can do it effectively, you can start to do video, you can start to do data, you can start to do all sorts of things. And what we're really talking about now is being not being more than just a passive observer. So when you Skype somebody, you're, a, you're sort of, you can talk with people, but you're really an observer of that remote environment. What we really want you to be able to do is go from being an observer remotely to being able to change the world. And the easiest way to do that is to, as I said, to teleport yourself. Matter um, transport would be one way to do that. I am hoping that in the in, in the lives of my grandchildren, grandchildren, we will be able to have teleporters. Uh, but let's say that that's not really possible right now. Um, and really say that one way that you can do that without transporting yourself is to actually have a robot do that for you. And that's really what we're talking about starting to come to the automation of physical machines. And what that means is, is that's what we're really talking about in terms of the robots. Um, and so the robot that we think of, of tomorrow is actually here. You've seen it just briefly. And so, um, so let me describe what this robot is. This is the Suitable Technologies Beam. Uh, we bought this uh, in January 2013. This is in my lab. That's me on the, on the screen. And what I can do is from anywhere around the world, I can be able to to log in, I can beam in and drive around, have the hallway conversation that I can't necessarily have over Skype with, with somebody. I can go track somebody down. I can just see what's happening all by myself. Uh, I can do this from anywhere. So oftentimes I'm in California. I can go and visit my lab in Providence, Rhode Island, and I can see all sorts of things that are happening. Um, so with this, I'd like to just take a take a quick moment uh, to, to actually log into my lab and, uh, and say hi to John. So let's see if... Uh, John. All right. Let's see if this works. All right. Can you hear? Hi, John. Oops. Hi, John. Oh, no, that's just your volume. What's that? That was just your volume. Your microphone is muted. It's uh oh, my microphone is muted. Sorry. That's the that's the danger of doing high tech. On the screen. <laughs> uh, 
All right, I guess we're not gonna hear John because my microphone is in the But that's John. Uh, hi, John. There you go. I can actually talk with him. I think we'll, we'll see that in, in a little bit, but I can drive around the lab. So this is me driving around the lab. Uh, are you gonna give me the ball? There we go, give me the ball. Kick the ball around a little bit. Um, John, can we go out, can we go out the door? We'll just go out the door. So I'm not just restricted to the lab, but I can, I can go out the door. He can't hear me, but he's gonna understand. I mean, I wanna go out the door. <laughs>
Henry Evans is, uh, is, is, in, is currently in the Bay Area in California. Um, Henry uh, suffered a stroke about a little over 10 years ago. Um, and from that stroke, it's, it's rendered him a mute quadriplegic. Uh, Henry basically relies on other people to do all of his activities of daily living. To eat, bathe himself, take care of the house. Somebody else has to do it. But people like Henry want to be able to do things on their own. Just because he's very sharp mentally, but he's just not physically capable. But he still has a desire, a burning desire, to be able to do things in the world. In, in fact, not just desire, ambition. Ambition is what, what, drive, what drives Henry. And so, he's, so, and Henry he even told me himself that 100 years ago, he would have been dead in his position. 30 years ago, he would have just had, his life would have been, you know, he would have been locked in his own head. But through technology, he's been able to do more and engage with the world. So, for example, uh, Henry can, can can communicate with his wife. So his wife sort of serves as his own autocorrect feature. Uh, he does that by using his head to look at look at letters on a letter board. R-O-C-B, robot. So by looking at those letters, he's able to he's able to communicate, and his wife is able to interpret what he what he wants to say. Um, he can also use that same that same uh, that same approach to moving his head to communicate by controlling a cursor on the screen. So he can we have tracking systems that can look at where his head is pointed, and then be able he can use that to be able to control a cursor on the screen and be able to type out things. Um, he can also he can use that same interface to be able to control a web browser and to create and to do things uh, on the web to surf the web to post emails. I get endless emails from Henry. Um, we are able to get all, he's able to engage with the world purely through, through, through information. And that's really powerful. That's really what the last, the computer revolution of the last 30 or 40 years has brought you. But one thing that, that was not really possible until recent years is for Henry to do something like play soccer. And through these interfaces, such as the Beam, such as through these technologies, he's able to do things like play soccer. This is him playing soccer with me in the lab. I'm controlling the other robot. Um, and if you're a quadriplegic who does who's lost the ability to move, this is really powerful. What you can't hear is him laughing the whole time. Uh, um, but like, just think, if you're bedridden, that's an amazing feeling. Uh, Henry was also able to go out. Uh, he, had a, he had a friend visiting campus, and so he wanted a campus tour. So the, the same devices, we were able to walk. He was able to walk around campus, stroll around campus, and, uh, and be able to, to, to guide, to get a tour of campus. Uh, so this is, uh, this is just uh, this is just a video of him uh, of him taking a bus, sort of escorting him through through campus, and he's doing that all on his own, right? And so that really is a that's an immensely powerful feeling for for us. Um, one thing that Henry and I did was uh, we gave a TED talk. So if you want to hear more about our sports with with Henry, you can you can see our TED talk. Henry was was in his bed in California when we gave this talk in Washington D.C. And that really is sort of breaking down the barriers of time, uh, of time and distance and geography. And that's just really amazing to see. But it's not just Henry in this case that we're, that we're helping. For instance, we've had uh, people like Ryan Williams. So this is, this is Ryan Williams here. He came to, he's, he actually suffered a car accident in 2006 uh, while, while in a PhD program at USC. And through, through information technology, through telecommunication technology, he was able to finish his PhD in, uh, in multi-robot coordination. And through the beam, he actually gave a remote talk. And so this is this was something that was was, was great to see. So so the, you know so you have people who are disabled through this technology being able to get PhDs. Uh, this is Stuart Turner. Stuart is in Manchester, England. Uh, Stuart, was, this is a picture of him using the beam in my office. Uh, but he's actually he's flying drones in our lab. He's driving around. He's somebody who we can collaborate with. I believe Stuart gave his own TED talk, which should, should be coming online. I hope uh, very shortly. Um, and this is Josh Tyler. Uh, Josh Tyler is not a quadriplegic. Uh, he is not physically disabled. He actually is one of the one of the lead developers uh, for the for the suitable technologies beam. And this is him giving a talk from uh, from Mountain View, California, to at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And one of the things that that Josh and I talk about very frequently, which I think is really important, is that what this technology has to do is change. It has the potential for changing the nature of labor and work. Right, right now when you're working, you're working in a location, you have to you have to be nearby where your where your work is. Right, when you move somewhere for a job, you have to think about you know what's the school system going to be like. You know what are the opportunities that are available. Will 
I like living in that area. But what if you want to live somewhere else and then we'll take a job in another location? Through this technology, it would be possible. And so, uh, so that really leads me, so, so given the impact of this technology in terms of labor and workforce, that leads to basically the three basic questions that I'm, that I'm asked frequently. One is, so where's my robot? First, as soon as I say robotics, the first question that's asked is, where is my robot? And I think I'd like to convince you, I think I've already had, I hope I've already convinced you that they are already here. It's not just one robot, but it would be multiple robots. The next question would be, are robots going to take my job? <laughs> and that's a very serious, serious question. I think, you know, lots of people ask me and they joke about it, but I as a robotist take that very seriously because I believe the answer is going to be yes. And what you have to, and what everybody has to do is start to think about not just trying to get a job from an employer that's already there, but creating your own job. Everybody's going to have to become an entrepreneur in this very high tech, high tech environment. Uh, so then that leads to the next question, which is, how can I get involved in robotics? And I'll talk about that later on. But the early answer is that you need to learn how to program. Pro computer programming is the language of autonomy, the language of high high technology. Um, and so I'll talk about how you can get involved in that later. Uh, so this is the point in the talk where I turn into amateur economist and try to try to try to give you a sense of how how robots and autonomy are going to change your it's going to change the, the labor force. So if you look at the, the unemployment rate, this is the unemployment rate from 1948 to 2014 to this month, uh, you can see that, that at, at a certain point, right after the, the latest recession, we were up to 10% unemployment. And we're back down to 6%, which sounds good, but I think a lot of those cases, those are jobs that were for people who have maybe left the workforce or maybe underemployed. Uh, but I would claim that, that that last bump is really an artifact of, of not just cyclical recession, but it's actually an issue of uh, it is an issue of technology and, and automation. Um, but before I, I get into that, I just want to say that this affects, you know, this affects at people with, across different types of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds uh, disproportionately. It affects um, different uh, different um, different regions. Uh, Rhode Island, for instance, is it, you know, Rhode Island is really up there in terms of in terms of uh, unemployment rate and economic opportunities. Um, but really what it comes down to more so is that it, it really comes to income inequality. So if you think about average income in 1979, before the, you know, really before personal computing took off, uh, if you were in the bottom 20% of, of, of income, you made about, in 2007 dollars, you made about $50,000. If you were in the top 1%, you made about $500,000. If we Look at how that, how your share of income, and look, and look how much your income has changed across these two different groups over time. I'll reveal that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and that really is a 10% disparity between the top and the bottom. So if we look and see how this has changed over time, you can see that the top 1% and also the top 20% have disproportionately, uh, disproportionately improved their status over the over the rest of over the rest of um, of the rest of the society. And so you can just look at that and say, the top 1% in 2007 was making about $1.8 million. The bottom 20% still was making about $50,000, in you know, if you, if you adjust for everything. And that's a 36, 36 times difference, right? You can look at that a different way and just sort of say, what's the share of income that has changed? So if you look at the top 1% and the bottom 20%, and you see how they've changed since 1979, so if you're staying along the zero line, you've basically maintained your share of income. You can see that the top 1% has essentially widened themselves by about 150% from, you know, from the bottom 20%. And, the, and, and if you were not in the top 20%, you've actually, your share has actually declined since 1979, as opposed to people in the top 20%. And I think what these things can be, I, there's many explanations for this, but I would give the technological explanation for why this is, for why this has changed. And it relates to computing, how computing and automation has, and technology has changed, uh, has changed the society. So for instance, in 1979, that really was when, was when personal computing was, was, uh, was starting to be introduced. Personal computing lets you automate your spreadsheets, automate your documents, automate those things that would have been done by maybe an accountant, maybe a clerical person. Uh, and then we have a recession. Uh, so, you know, so maybe the precursor to high frequency trading, and it went down, but then around 1994, you had the internet and the web boom, and it all took off, and now you're, now that's putting brick and mortar stores, and people that are doing things physically, 
uh, you know, we're starting to automate those tasks. Then we had a short dot-com bust, and then you saw Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Google start to take off, and you saw social networking become the same. And so these cycles are basically giving more to the people that can produce more. It's not that the, the, the people that are not in the top 20% are less skilled, or less, are, are, are doing things worse, it's just that pro with productivity gains that are given to the top 20%, are really the people that are the developers and entrepreneurs have given us a leg up, and we need to balance that. There are many, um, there are many books. So even though I'm playing amateur economist, there's people, there's real people out there that, that have different store, different uh, different takes on it. So there's a large body of literature. I think Jaron Lanier has a, has an excellent book where he basically makes the, the case that uh, one of his guiding examples that is, um, that Kodak, for instance, employed hundreds of thousands of people 30, 40 years ago and was a billion dollar business. Instagram was just bought for a billion dollars and employs about 13 people. And so that really changes how we should think about work, how we should think about how these technologies are gonna change labor and, and, and as somebody who produces more autonomous technology, I'm very concerned about that. I'm concerned about what, how my technology is going to be used within society. And robotics is, is only going to accelerate this trend by a lot because we'll be able to automate this so I think part of the takeaway is that no one's job is safe, not even my job is safe. Everybody has to, to some extent, become an entrepreneur. Uh, any job that can be automated, I believe, will disappear. And we hope that the technology gains that are produced from our technology will create more jobs than they disappear. Um, but that's not necessarily, that's something that we're, we have to really engage to figure that out. Um, so it's easy for me to say this as somebody who has, a, I have a very nice job at Brown University. You know, maybe I have nothing to fear. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. So I took the time to, to, to show an example of automation, um, and that is, I, and for that, I'd like to, to give my presentation over uh, to Otto Chad Jenkins, who is going to, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit more about automation. And so to just show that I, can, I could potentially be Chad, I am Otto Chan Jenkins. A presentation that was scripted by the human Chan Jenkins. I was created to automate the presentation of the human Chan Jenkins slides. I am a demonstration of how any job could be automated as technology advances. More specifically, anything that can be scripted will be automated. Think of the script as a recipe for a computer or any machine to perform a task. These scripts are called algorithms. For example, here is an algorithm for how most people play the game Pictionary. Ha ha. Ha ha. The human Chan Jenkins programmed me to think this is funny. Computer programs are how human programmers express algorithms digitally such that they can be understood and executed by a computer. It is our job as engineers, computer scientists, and roboticists to automate as many tasks as we can to make them cheaper, more efficient, and people more productive. Through computers, we have automated many traditional information jobs in our society, including filing, clerical, and accounting tasks, mail correspondence, shopping, social interactions, news dissemination, and, increasingly, our education. Algorithms are also used to automate machines for a variety of tasks, which is essentially robotics. We commonly think of robots working in factories or assembly lines. However, we encounter many automated systems in our daily experiences that have become commonplace. Cruise control, programmable thermostats, traffic lights, and elevators are all examples of automated machines prevalent in daily life, even physical tasks with life and death consequences, such as autopilot on commercial air flights, have been successfully automated, a fact most of us should appreciate given that we flew here for this conference. This is only the beginning of the trend for automation. We already have autonomous systems delivering medicines in hospitals, assisting with medical diagnoses, 
harvesting for agriculture, exploring the dangerous and unknown, and making American manufacturing competitive. This increasing automation will no doubt increase the productivity of individuals. However, given the trends resulting from computing, these productivity gains will likely disproportionately benefit those who already are well off. This also provides an opportunity for people across the socioeconomic spectrum to create new jobs and careers. The human chat Jenkins will now discuss how learning the language of automation, computer programming, can give you and your students the skills to not just keep up with but thrive in our increasingly automated world. Back to you, Chad. So I just want to show that and be like, so I had to create that, I had to program that in, but once I programmed it, it does the presentation. You don't necessarily need me anymore. You need me for the next presentation. But that really gets to the, the divide, what, what you pay for when you're, when you're trying to hire somebody. Creativity, the ability to do new things, to adapt, that's what people are good at. Uh, robots and computers are good at following scripted tasks that you, can, that you can give to a computer. And that really is the difference. But we as, as roboticists and computer science want to automate more. And the, the way to automate is through being fluent in, in, in computation, to be able to program. Computation is the language of automation. If you're fluent in computation, you can make, you can script things for computers, you can do things. And programming fluency is becoming like basic literacy. Like basic literacy. Um, and so I would, I would say to you that you really should, no matter what your discipline, you should be teaching your, your students uh, basic programming. Maybe not super advanced, but like, but something where they know how to express themselves. Um, so this really gets to my last point that I wanted to make which is how can, how can you get involved in robotics? And really that means you should, you should be learning how to program computers. Um, you, should be, you should be gaining your computational fluency. And I should rephrase that and say, it's not just you want to learn how to program computers, you should be learning JavaScript and HTML5. Um, I, I think that's the easiest, best way. It used to be that you had to, to have big computers, you had to have lots of computational resources in order, to, in order to learn computers. Now, everything that you need is in your browser. So here's a quick question. Uh, who in the room has used JavaScript and HTML5? So for those of you who, uh, who have not raised your hands, you don't know it, but you're fine. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you use Google, you use JavaScript and HTML5. Everything that you see in the browser that's made of when Google presents something to you, it is JavaScript and HTML5 that is making that happen. If you visited a high-tech website, all of that was done in JavaScript and HTML5. Everything that you can do, every, everything that you need to make that is sitting in your browser. You can do it. There's no resource barrier to it. The only barrier is, is your knowledge and your skills. Um, Facebook, everything there, that's JavaScript and HTML5. That's doable. You can even see it. They even show you the code that they're, that they're using to do it. Um, Amazon. Uh, even if somebody has a spiffy website themselves, uh, so that, that's Mike. Right? Uh, you know, that was done in JavaScript and HTML5. In fact, I can show you a little bit, uh, just show you how that works. I downloaded, uh, I downloaded my site here. So, you know, so here's a copy of it. So when you go and you click on it, and, uh, you, it pops up, you see a nice, a nice, uh, nice face right there. Uh, I can see all the code, so I can, so when I download this, everything is available so that, so all of this text right here, all this gobbledygook, is basically the code that, that's used to present that front end. But because I'm literate in computing, I can see it, I can change it, I can read and write in this language. Uh, I can make myself the executive director. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, there we go. That's me, Chad J. Kubasis, uh, executive director. Uh, and, and I think this really just gets to, to basic, I mean, I'm not showing this to, to, to take Mike's job, I don't think I can do this job, but, uh, but I'm just showing that I can read and write this language, this did not take me very long to do. And I think that gets to the point of just basic, of this being just fluency, literacy. Um, and so, in order to learn JavaScript, there's all sorts of tutorials and things online. You know, I, you know, you can teach yourself. When I was a kid, I had to read manuals. I had to, you know, you really had to go to a four-year college to be able to learn this. But now, a lot of it is online. So, this is Code Academy. Code Academy is just one of the online resources. 
And if you look at their course, they basically say they can teach you JavaScript in 10 hours. They can teach you HTML and and you know, in a, in a few hours, and that just gives you the basics, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that the code that you write is going to be incredible, right? I can write lots of words; those words may not mean anything, but I can put them together. You still have to have the electrical engineering, the computer science, the math, the physics, the chemistry in order to do something interesting with quick programming. But the basic literacy, the syntax, you can get that. Uh, so I started to make. I, I made a, a little website that shows examples of how to do this. So I really love physics and video games, so I just put all my examples up here. Uh, so I just want to show a few examples of things you can do in the browser. Um, so in addition to this, uh, so this is this is JS Fiddle. So if you go to jsfiddle.net, uh, you can start to write your own JavaScript very quickly. Uh, I will, so if you go to our site, you can you can see this. And I just wrote like a very simple spring simulation. So that's just me clicking on this on the spring, moving it up and down. It's for those of you who who know who know physics. This is just a very simple Hooke's law. I'm done, and this is not a lot of code, and the code is available, you can see it, right? The resource barrier for this is, is not even there. You can, if with the knowledge, you can do this immediately. So, so this, um, if you start to do more advanced things, so this is just a simple spring math system, you can fairly quickly start to do things like, this. by the way, this is not mine, I've coded this, but it's, this is not mine. This is a, this is a JavaScript FOSS simulation, right? This, not, this isn't very difficult, so going from my spring to this is not very difficult. What you need in order, if you have the basic fluency in computing, you can, ba you can make this really, you can make the drawing and, uh, and you can get on your browser very easily. Uh, you still need to know the physics in order to make this, to make this work. So it doesn't devalue the education. Also, I can rip this out. <laughs> Um, people that made this did a, did a really good job. My class simulator doesn't look quite as nice, but, but it's there. But this is available. You just type, you just type in class simulation JS Fiddle, and you get this, and you can see it, and you can see the code. It's completely transparent. So I believe your students should be should be looking at this. Uh, when I teach my course, so this is this is the, the robot that we make when we teach my course. So so basically, I teach a robot kinematics and dynamics class. Uh, this is a 3D rendering of a, of a, of a, of a of our robot. Our robot can move around, it gets a little collision, so whenever it collides with something, the base turns red. Uh, I can have the arm move to a particular location. We cover all the algorithms for doing this, but the 3D rendering and everything that it takes to make this happen is just available, and I think it's, it's for me, a computer scientist, I say extremely easy to use. I know there's, there's still a learning curve, but the tools are there. Um, and so that basic computational fluency, I think, is really So I just wanted to, to say that these examples are available for use, and you, your students can learn them if they're not learning already. One of the more compelling things that we've done with JavaScript and HTML is, uh, is we started, that's where our collaboration with Henry Evans started. So Henry is the, is the physically disabled the quadriplegic we've been working with, and this really started when Henry saw that there were drones available. When you had quad rotor helicopters that you, know, that you could essentially download and you buy it, you download an app for it, and you're flying. And that really, you know, for somebody who's bedridden, this was really important to be able to move around and do things on your own, especially moving fast. Uh, the, this is the Pair Air drone. It's only three hundred dollars. I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, this is really accessible. It's not. Uh, I'm not showing you something that, that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, we just go to the Brookstone. So, like, I think one of the the drone we sent you, we were going to show, is really just uh, we just bought it at Reagan National Airport. You know, it's not. You know, we just walk in the Brookstone, buy it, and we're ready to go. Um, and so what the real challenge is, is that if you're, if you're a project leader, using an iPhone is really difficult. And so one thing that we've been able to do is write, write, use JavaScript and HTML5 to write web interfaces for Henry to use his same assistive technology to be able to control the drone. Um, and so, uh, so this web interface basically looks like this. So this is, this is the computer at the bottom right here. Uh, the drone has a forward facing camera so I can see it. Uh, so you can see me driving driving the drone right there. That's, that's my screen. I can see through the front facing camera. We made nice big buttons for Henry to click. And so we're just driving that around. Um, very easy to do. This, doesn't, this didn't take a lot to do it. Um, and this was, this was Henry's first flight uh, with, with, uh, with, with the drone at his house. So Henry's looking at the... Uh, so Henry can, 
basically just sit in his in his uh, in his in his in his in his, uh, in his home, look out the window, fly drone. And this was this was his first flight, so uh, being quadriplegic, it's hard for him to go out and look at his garden. So he immediately made a beeline for for his garden. It's over here. You'll, you'll see that in a second. Um, and so. So he's just going down and looking at the garden, checking it out. Henry's a, and because he's uh, he's been restricted for so long in his movement, he is much more much much more of a daredevil. I would never go that low. Um, I think we, we unleashed something we did not know about him when we gave him this capability. Um, but in that flight, he went you know he wanted to go see the solar panels that they put on his roof. You know, like I mean, even I, an able-bodied person, don't necessarily want to get on my roof. Uh, but a drone is easy to do that, which can, which can lead to inspection and manufacturing uh, tasks. Uh, he wanted to go check out the ravine that was below his house, and so he did a flight there. Uh, he crashed, you know, he, he wanted to land on top of my car, so he landed, so he crashed when he went while trying to do that. Um, but even with that, uh, you know, we always have crashes, so, uh, so he, he's decent, but he's not great, so, you know, so he, he can fly the drone on his own, but oftentimes a lot of, a lot of this happens. Uh, <laughs> One of our more spectacular crashes was, was during that first flight, so, so the drone is right up there. Uh, this happens. Uh, <laughs> but at $300, you don't really care. And we still use that drone. It actually held up pretty well. Um, so, it, uh, so Henry um, Henry actually is able to fly drones in our lab. So this Henry's still in San Francisco. This is my lab in Providence, Rhode Island. He's able to fly around, uh, you know, just do things on the road. He wanted to see it over Google Talk this time. Uh, but he's able to just, uh, he's able, the same way that we took tours with the, with the beam device, uh, he, he was able to take, he was able to take, uh, take a tour of the drone, and just fly around, and be able to do it on his own. And I think giving that level of independence of mobility, giving that sense of dignity, is really important for, for people in Henry's situation. Um, so at this point, uh, I hope Alice is nearby. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, I, as I said before, doing is believing. Uh, so if you don't see it for yourself, it does not uh, it does not count. So we're going to we're going to do it. Uh, we as the developers were okay. Like you know, our, we're not pilots. We're developers, right? So that's 
the in, that was the same interface that Henry used. If you want to see him use it, you can just, just check out our TED talk. Um, but but making that that interface that you saw is purely JavaScript and HTML5. It's not. It's nothing really that much different than the site that you will see on Google, or the high tech website, or Amazon. It's the same technology. It's available for you. You can use it. You can do it. And the drone is, is only three hundred dollars. So like. So the barrier for entry for getting involved in robotics is lower than it's ever been. The technology is more democratic than it's ever been. Um, so getting to this, uh, so we've talked about robot telepresence, we've talked about essentially robots as remote control devices, but, uh, but really the next step past that, so instead of having to control the robot all of itself, really the next step is thinking about autonomous robotics. So how do we go from just being able to have like a fancy remote control device to actually having a robot be able to do things for us, be able to delegate things. So like, I want to be in conference room A. Please take me to conference room A. Um, what that really involved, the barrier for entry, is having the robots be able to perceive things. Right now, robots have the same sense of sight, perception, uh, and the, the ability to do things. It's sort of like a two-year-old kid with really thick glasses, thick foggy glasses, and mittens on. Right? Uh, that's where, where we're at. We're trying to, and one of the things that we really need to do is give the robots a better sense of perception of things that they can do. Um, and so, and in doing that, we'd be able to do more things for, for Henry, for, for people like Henry. So this is from our colleagues at Georgia Tech. Um, they have, they use the web interface technology we've developed at Brown uh, for doing JavaScript and HTML5 with robots. Uh, and they created an interface for Henry to control this robot, which is the Willow Garage PR2. Uh, and so Henry can see what the robot sees. He has buttons to be able to control the robot to do things. Uh, you know, Henry has to be able to scratch an itch every once in a while. He wants to be able to do that. He wants to be able to eat a meal for himself. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Henry essentially shaving himself for the first time since his stroke. Um, these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to do and enable. And, and on the front end, it's really just, it's really just making a web page. Um, and so, Henry has to control all, all of this itself, itself. But what we're so this is the Willow Garage, Willow Garage uh, robot, by the way. Um, and so at the bottom, there's a laser range scanner. This is one of the, the critical advices for him, Henry to be able to say, "I want the robot to be in this location. I tell the robot what to do." Uh, what we do with this sensor in order to allow it to navigate from one place to another, uh, we have to build something like the equivalent of Google Maps. Um, and we do that by by essentially taking the laser scan readings. The laser scan readings essentially give you a polygon of open area in front of the robot. As the robot moves around, we stitch that together to essentially build a floor map of a building. Um, and so this is us. Uh, this is a web page that we created for just uh, for just basically going around and building a building a map of a building. Um, once we do that, we essentially have uh, we essentially have something that looks like this, uh, which is an, which looks like an unintelligible mess, but actually is a more accurate description of the act, of the architectural floor plan of the, of the building. Than, you would, than, than maybe the architect actually would have imagined, because we actually are, are measuring it ourselves. Um, and so once you have that map, you can start to label areas of space. You can say, hey, that's the bikes over there. Same way you label something in, in Google Maps, you would label it in, uh, you could label it on, on the robot's map. And you can say that the cafe, the bikes are over here. And once the robot knows that the bikes are in that location, you can say, robot, I want you to go to the bikes for me. And the robot can autonomously navigate itself to that location. And you're going to increasingly see a lot of these types of systems. The robot's going to, you're, you're not going to, the, the, the person will always be in control, but in, the, the robot will be able to do more things for you, will be able to navigate for you, be able to pick things up for you, and you're going to, you're more like the supervisor of a, of a capable system. Um, one thing that we're also able to do is using the Microsoft Connect, which is a 3D sensor, not just build planar maps, but start to build 3D maps. Uh, so this is our robot moving around. I sped this up eight times. But it's essentially building a 3D map of our of our of our lab right here. Uh, this is another 3D map. It might be a little too fast, but uh, but you can see me. You can see Alice in the map. Uh, we're we're essentially going to start to be able to build 3D geometries. Um, the last the last one we're going to show um, is uh, is a map that we built of our fourth floor. So the robot is basically moving all around the fourth floor and building a map of the fourth floor, a three dimensional geometrical map of the of the fourth floor. And so with that, you should be able to start to, that will give us the data to be able to recognize things, to be able to say, that's where you go to get, to, to get, your, get, your, to get your drinks. This is where you should go to, to find Chad. This is where you should go to, to do, to, to, um, to, to get me a beer or something like that. This is really the next step. This is what's coming out of research into the types of robots that you're seeing. 
So in conclusion, I hope I've, I've answered the three basic questions that, that I usually get, get asked. Uh, so where is my robot? Those robots are already here, and they're, they're accessible. And we're really going to make those robots better and better and better. They will be able to do more things for you. Uh, robots want to take my job. Yes, they're going to take, they can take my job. But really, everybody has to be their own entrepreneur. You have to think about creating your own job and doing, what, doing something with the technology. And if you want to get involved in robotics, you can make your own robot. Mechanical engineering is valuable. Electrical engineering is valuable. But really, computer programming is the language of autonomy. And that's basic. That's becoming basic to us. So with that, I think you should be able to help us reach out and change the world. Thank you very much.
So the areas of, 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 of greatest growth, I think, in robotics, I think lots of people want to think about manufacturing. We're starting to see that. Agriculture is a, is a, is a very big issue. Um, I think education, so using uh, robots like the Beam, uh, are being used for, for tutoring, for, you know, for, for engaging with, with, uh, with lots, of, um, lots, of, lots, of, lots of kids. Uh, increasingly, the big, probably the biggest issue that, that I see, and the reason why our work is more geared toward, is healthcare and medicine. Um, because you have such a huge aging population, uh, we, that really is going to break the country, uh, break the world, if, we're, if we don't provide good solutions. And so robotic, you're seeing increasingly more robotic solutions are engaged for, engaged towards elder care, care and helping the disabled, uh, because there's a real cost value in our proposition there. Actually, can I take one more? Or one more? All right. Uh, real quick, you just mentioned uh, the idea of healthcare and robotics and how that's going to help the agents. Thinking about Henry, do you see the miniaturization factor where those robots can then be, this is going to probably sound silly, but basically be used as servo mechanisms to restore some of the mobility to a person like Henry right. using the technology. Obviously, you know, a robot like that is too big to put in a body, but right. you see the miniaturization factor also coming in. Ab play. Absolutely. In fact, I have colleagues at, at Brown University. So, so, so the, the, the question was, can you use the robotic technology to restore movement to somebody physically, directly, like Luke Skywalker, right? Skywalker loses yes, the hand. and I didn't want to make it sound yeah, like that. Well, you know, I mean, that's what it is. You know, Luke Skywalker loses the hand, and from the time he gets a new hand, it's robotic, and sh -sh 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 -sh, you know, that's great. Um, I think that's the dream. I, that is, a, I think, a longer term dream. I don't know how possible it is, but we do have people at Brown, my colleagues at Brown, who are working on that exact problem. Because part of it is getting the actual device and fitting it on, right? You have to make sure that works. In, you know, integrating it into the central nervous system, into the tendons of the body, and then also getting the signals from the brain to control the system, right? Um, and so a lot of people, so my colleagues work on essentially neural interfaces to, to, to sense what we're thinking and how you want the arm to move and move the arm that way. And so that, in addition to the things I'm talking about, is coming, right? If you want to essentially augment the body. So I think, I mean, that's just one of my stuff, the stuff that, that's at Brown, uh, I mean, the other stuff in neural interfaces, all of this is part of a large ecosystem that's coming. The revised revolution is coming. I think we should be prepared for it. So why don't we, uh, uh, thank you again, Chad. Let's see that uh, selfie picture that we took. <laughs>